So I, I just it, it just came to my mind to a little bit look at what does this mean the lineage of the so-called Mahasi lineage, or lineage of Venerable Mahasi Sada, as this center has been recognized by UBI as a center in the lineage of Mahasi Sada. So uh, it would be good to know <laughs> what it is, what it means, and so. And uh, of course, long ago I have read the. Um, The life story of Mahasi Sayadaw, there is a biography of his, but there is, uh, of course, more to that. And uh, <coughs> lineage, in a way, is history, and uh, li a Buddhist lineage actually goes back to the Buddha. Uh, but, of course, we cannot track everything. But still, it would be interesting to go back to the Buddha, especially in one respect. Uh, <coughs> and this respect is that at the time of the Buddha, during the life of the Buddha, uh, he established the so-called four... Uh <coughs> how you call it in English? The four assemblies. That means the order of monks, the order of uh, nuns, the or, uh, and then the lay people and the the lay men and the lay women. And so it was quite uh, usual that both ordained and lay people would receive dharma, would receive instructions, would practice and would also be uh, highly realized. So there, w and, and it even went so far that there have been a few, uh, no, even lay people mentioned in the suttas who would at times also teach in a very humble way, but they were able to do that. And <coughs> So this was quite normal at that time, and we will see that uh, uh, regarding uh, this, uh, regarding the uh, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw and others in uh, Burma uh, last century, that they revived something that has been there in the beginning when the Buddha was still alive, and. We can find this also in the suttas, and I would like to give a, uh, a quote. This is from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, and there is something interesting happening. That, uh, if about three months before the Buddha laid down this body and uh, attained Parinibbana, and he was already old, he was 80 years old, Mara arrived to Buddha, and Mara said to Buddha something like, ah, you can already pass pass on now, you can die now, you don't have to care for anyone anymore. And here Mara says, Because, and Mara quotes the, ble the, the Buddha, because for the blessed one spoke these words to me at another time. I will not come to my final passing away until my bhikkhus and my bhikkhunis, my laymen and laywomen, have come to be true disciples, wise, well disciplined apt and learned, preservers of the Dhamma, living according the d to the Dhamma, abiding by the appropriate conduct, and having learned the Master's word, are able to expound it, to preach it, 
to proclaim it, to establish it, to reveal it, to explain it in detail and make it clear until when adverse opinions arise, they shall be able to refute them thoroughly and well and to preach this convincing and liberating Dhamma. And now, because Bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen have become the blessed one's disciple in just this way. And then it's repeated, because this is an abridged version, uh, it's repeated four times, once for monks, once for nuns, once for laymen, once for laywomen, that they have these qualities. And the Buddha acknowledges this, that it is like this. So from that we can... Uh, uh, see that um, all these four assemblies uh, had uh, the possibility to uh, really approach the Dhamma fully. And what happened later, in later years or, or uh, centuries, that it was not uh, so easy for lay people to uh, have this, uh, these opportunities in uh, practice of Dhamma. And even uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, and now we're looking more to Burma, uh, this was at no way uh, use, uh, uh, normal. Even uh, there have been times where few monks were meditating or uh, <coughs> and there was more the scholarly side uh, that was um, more prominent. We can also see that for example in Thailand in many traditions uh, for lay people there is not much access. They would limit the time of formal practice for seven days and it, you don't have the opportunity to uh, 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 practice more intensively for a longer time. Or, of course, uh, 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 one could ordain and then have all these possibilities. And what happened is that in the 19th century in Burma, there arose a movement where the lay people were more included into uh, 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 learning and uh, practice. And this happened because there was a threat. They were stressed because uh, imperialism came and the uh, British were kind of conquering these areas. And there have been uh, the so-called Anglo-Burmese Wars where uh, British were annexing certain parts of Burma first, well, they came from India and first annexed uh, that parts that are most close to India. And this became a threat to the Burmese people. The British imperialists would not uh, remove their shoes when entering a temple. And that was, would be quite a threat for the Burmese people. Uh, uh, they would later establish uh, schools, missionary schools. They would send missionaries. So there was this sense that uh, Buddhism uh, uh, is threatened in Burma. And then there was the second uh, Anglo-Burmese war in the mid 19th century where the British annexed Lower Burma which is where is nowadays Yangon and Bago I think Bago was or, uh, a capital at the time uh, and uh, this hap and when this happened then uh, one king the king was uh, uh, replaced by his brother, because the brother thought that he could uh, defense, uh, defend uh, Burma from the uh, colonization. But that was not possible for him either. His name was King Mindon, but what he did was a, ki a kind of... Uh, <coughs> uh, he was trying to... Uh, 
preserve the culture in face of modernity. He also wanted to uh, uh, support Buddhism and uh, to preserve the Dhamma also for the next generations. So at that time it was very uh, strong efforts for a print uh, for uh, printing Dharma books and that Dharma would also be explained to the lay people. Uh, and there is a very important point and that is that in in these Buddhist countries, especially we have it still in Thailand, the king is responsible for the Dharma and the Sangha. So he is a kind of controlling faculty when the, uh, for example, if the Sangha gets corrupt, he has to observe this and to uh, take corrections. So for example, the king of Thailand and especially the last king of Thailand, he would really be uh, seen in this role. But now what happened in Burma is that uh, the that the uh, uh, British launched a third war and uh, uh, even after this king removed the capital to Mandalay to the north, they were already retreating from the British uh, and they also now uh, captured the whole country, whole of Burma. And uh, then finally they would uh, send the king, at that time it was already his son, King Mindon San was the king then, to India, so he was exiled to India and this was the end of uh, Burma being a kingdom. So they had no king anymore and this was quite even more threatening to the Dhamma because there is no one who would be in charge of uh, the Sangha. And so the uh, idea was that the lay people have to do this, but for this they should understand more of Dhamma as much as possible. And so uh, and also, at the same time, the threat from min missionaries where uh, there were schools established and they would say, well, send your children to our Christian school and then they will get good jobs in the government or whatever. And uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, some people in the Sangha felt that it is necessary to start a very broad movement to include the laity uh, also for Dhamma practice and so that they uh, uh, can also uh, stay with uh, Dhamma and that there will be no decline. And one of the first uh, known persons who, uh, amongst who started with this more a kind of mass movement teaching many many people was Lady Sayadaw and the and one of the uh, disciples of Lady Sayadaw was Uba Kin and one and he was a lay person he was in government or so and and uh, Uba Kin again had a disciple this was Goenka for me in, in who was then going to India. Anyway, I'm not going into that. But it needed places where many people can practice because before it was more like that, that uh, there might be local teachers and if you want to learn, you stick around with the local teacher, but it's not in any organized way. And, uh, and it's the approach is more for not so it's it's not for many people it's just for a few people who could do this and stick around with local teachers and here this is where actually this Mahasi lineage in a way started there was one monk and his name was Unarada and he lived 1868 to 1955 and Unarada uh, had this idea that he kind of wants to 
uh, establish a kind of practice that is easy, accessible, and quite to the point, uh, <coughs> uh, so that uh, people can have a deep insight. And uh, also for, and he also was searching for himself. And he heard of a hermit, who was also a Buddhist a, a, a Theravada monk, uh, who was said to be um, very wise, maybe enlightened. And he went there. And he went to Sagaing hin Hills. And I don't know who has been in Burma, but Sagaing Hills this is not in the north, not far from Mandalay. These are hills where there are so many monasteries and pagodas and caves. And this is a very, s and always has been a very specific place of practicing uh, Sangha there. Uh, and this Aletwa Sayadaw was his name. He lived there as a hermit. He had also a teacher, his, the, the, na the name of this teacher was Talon Sayadaw, we don't know anything about him, also don't know much about this hermit Sayadaw, just that um, uh, this Unarada went there and asked him for uh, <coughs> um, instruction to for uh, practicing uh, insight. And then, and this is just the narrative that one we got. And it's ac actually uh, the mm, German monk Nyana Ponika uh, uh, in his book, The Heart of Buddhist Meditation, uh, would also write about that. He uh, wrote that uh, <coughs> the answer of the hermit was something like that. He said, why are you looking outside? You can look directly uh, into the suttas and please study the Satipatthana Sutta and you, everything is in there. And it seems that this was done by Unarada. But studying Satipatthana Sutta in a country like Burma doesn't mean you just read one sutta because there is so much of uh, 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 commentaries and uh, a, a, a lot of theory to be found and uh, the monks uh, usually in Burma very very learned so he would not just uh, probably study Satipatthana Sutta but also the Satipatthana Samyutta or commentaries to it and so on but of course also sticking to the Sutta and he and it was then Unarada who developed the specific technique in accordance of or inspired by Satipatthana Sutta. And this is the technique that nowadays we call the technique of Mahasi Sayadaw, but actually it was the technique of Unarada. He just didn't get the <laughs> uh, uh, so well known with it. And Unarada uh, went down to southeast Burma, not so far from Mulmain, at a place called Taton, and opened the first meditation center there. And at that time, it was not uh, uh, so. You, uh, people were not used to have a meditation center because it's uh, this movement was just beginning. So it was also not. Uh, uh, normal uh, for everyone that there would be a meditation hall. They even didn't have a name for meditation center. So what they uh, did, they called it in that uh, they called it Yekta, and Yekta means shady place. And I show you now images because Bianca and me had been 2017, I think, there at this meditation center. Uh, that was uh, um, um, founded by Unarada, who later was called Mingon Chetavana uh, Sayadaw, which means the Sayadaw, the respected monk, from Mingon Chetavana Monastery. This was the name of the monastery. And 
It was indeed, or is still indeed, a shady place. And this is the place where later Mahasi Sada learned the practice. And so we, I don't know, maybe you want to come a little bit uh, uh, more close for a while, because if, oh. So this is the entrance. Okay, Aya Bianco is also there. And he, a lot of big trees. And this is the uh, building where Mahasisado was having, he didn't have a kuti, but he has a, had a room. And it was up on the first floor. So this nun is now opening us the gate and going up with us uh, to this uh, room where Mahasis Saida, or at that time his name was Usobana, was uh, practicing when he was not practicing in the hall. Uh, it's not very uh, <laughs> best quality, but this is inside of this room, this old building. Nowadays it seems it's more like a museum. No one will ever stay in this room. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Old furniture. Uh, and mm, this is the stair up to this uh, room. From up there you can see towards the meditation hall, which you almost can't see because there are so many trees. Yeah, But that down there is the meditation hall. Still people practicing there. Yeah? I don't know who is the teacher now, but they all just spoke Burmese, it was uh, not so easy to communicate, but it a little bit was, a little bit they could. And here they have all these photographs of Unarada, of Mahasi Sayadaw, when he was there, and also the Venerable Jnana Ponika, who is a German monk who stayed in Sri Lanka. Uh, he was still young uh, when he was in Burma, and he also was there uh, uh, practicing and then later practicing with Mahasi Sayada. No? Ah, and this is Unarada. They have a, uh, figure, a figure o o made of wax or something. Uh, and he's sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was opened 1911. Uh, and it was not before 1932 that uh, the Venerable Mahasisana was uh, there. Yeah. So, because uh, uh, Mahasisana was born 1904 and he became ordained as a novice with 12 years and a bhikkhu with 20 years and he was from northern Burma and with 24 he went to Mandalay to get some scholastic education and he was uh, of course a very uh, a good student and soon also teaching, uh, not meditation but teaching the texts and so on and uh, he was invited to Mulmain, which is in the southeast of Burma, not far from that place, to a monastery to teach there the scriptures. And it was there that his wish to learn the meditation practice arose, and he heard that not so far away there is this Unarata uh, teaching that, and so he went, he, he took leave, uh, he asked his Abbot, if he could leave uh, the monastery for practice, and he allowed it. And so he came in 1932 to that monastery, and Unarada would be his teacher. And that's also interesting. He practiced there for about three months, and it seems that his practice was going exceptionally well. But after three months, his teacher in the other monastery got, and the abbot in the other monastery got sick and ordered him back. So he could not continue and had to go back to this monastery. Uh, but uh, it seemed that anyway, even in these three months, it, m he must have been very accomplished or so. Uh, 
uh, I don't know if he then had the opportunity to again come back, but uh, it's uh, always said that these three months were very crucial. And uh, so he stayed again in Moulmain. And then later in 1938, he went to Upper Burma to his hometown. And it was just a small village, I think in the area of a town called Schwebo, if I'm not wrong. And this, there was a little monastery, a small monastery, where he would start teaching. Teaching the method also, not just uh, theory, but also this method that he learned from Unarada. And in this monastery, they had a big drum. And whenever he would give a Dhamma talk, before he would beat the big drum. And uh, the name of big drum in Pali means Maha, Maha, big, see the drum. And so he got the name Mahasi Sayada, the, the Sayada with the big drum. So that is wha how he, uh, he got his name. His original Dharma name was Usobana. So <coughs> Mahasi Sayada beating the big drum, giving Dhamma talks, teaching people in this village, uh, but this didn't make him yet uh, well known all over the country, or it was just more uh, a local thing. But then, during World War II, where there was even more chaos in the country and they had the Japanese invasion, uh, he moved, as far as I know, to this nearby town, Shwebo if I remember right from his biography. Anyway, at that time he would write uh, <coughs> this, the Vipassana Dipani, which is in English the Manual of Insight. Uh, do you know that one? <laughs> 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 yeah. So, uh, and so that is, uh, say, commentary or description of the practice, but what was what is exceptionally important in Burma, more in Burma than in other countries, is that when someone is teaching something, it has to be in accordance with the texts. It has to be in accordance not only with Sutta, but it should be in accordance, in accordance with Abhidhamma, it should be in, in accordance with the commentaries, with sub-commentaries and so on. So there is a whole hierarchy of uh, scholarly work that starts well, uh, with the commentaries, which they call Attakata, and the sub-commentaries, which are called the Tika, and then there are sub-sub-commentaries, and then the more modern works on top of that can be called Dipani. So it is, uh, he was writing uh, this uh, Dipani or Vipassana Dipani. And <coughs> uh, it was important that this was kind of fitting into what one could call the Theravada orthodoxy. Theravada orthodoxy means what comes after suttas, what comes with commentaries, what comes also with the Visuddhimagga and so on. And this is in Burma very, very important. It is, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 so, <coughs> and he has been also later been challenged. And I know there is a book in the library where he has, for example, to uh, 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 write to some Sri Lankan scholar, they are writing forth and back, uh, because it was, for example, challenged that as a meditation object, the rising and falling of the abdomen is never mentioned in the sutta, or how he co can uh, uh, <coughs> uh, where he can fit that in into the uh, in, in, into the uh, texts and so on. So, but it seems that uh, intellectually Mahasi Sayadaw was very fit and very uh, learned. 
so that he could fulfill this uh, <coughs> and so he got with this work very very quite famous in Burma and in 1947 which I think was also the year where uh, Burma got independent I think India got independent in 47 and I think at the same time Burma and so they had now in their own government and a rich man from the government approached Mahasi Sadao and said we have a big patch of land at Yangon and we are building a, a meditation center there that should be big enough for many many people we would, uh, we would like to invite you as the teacher there and he uh, approved and moved there and became the resident teacher of the so-called Mahasi Center. I haven't been practicing at the Mahasi Center. Venerable Vivekananda had been practicing at the Mahasi Center when he started, but I visited it and it's quite interesting because it's in the middle of a town more as and it's like a town in itself so you would walk there there are many cars some are driving some are just parked there and there is a meditation hall where yogis go up and down and then there is a building where some people um, have their rooms and then there will be another meditation hall and another building and uh, like a little town but not so nice in the countryside <laughs> like here anyway so uh, and what they now did there at this meditation center uh, was that really a lot of people uh, sangha but also many many lay people would come there and practice there and um, I heard that it was quite usual that something like 500 or 800 meditators would be at the same time at this center. And this is still today, for example, in the Panditarama Semaingon, uh, in April, when there is the holiday season for the Burmese, there can be, I think, even thousand people practicing there. And there are other meditation centers in Burma where even at normal times there are thousand practitioners at the same time and it's huge and it is not it's like one could imagine like the whole Monte Santo belongs to <laughs> <laughs> this place and there would be uh, also a part for the women and a part for the monks and for the nuns uh, uh, all spread out so there is still enough space and so on and <coughs> uh, so here you really can speak of a kind of mass movement yeah so but uh, for a mass movement uh, it is it seemed to be helpful to have a clear-cut approach also to the practice that is effective so that they can handle so many people and uh, so what started at the Mahasi Center was that they would have these interviews which are in a certain way so that yogis would not take one hour to describe what they experienced but that this would be already in a, that they would already be informed of how to report and so be short and to the point uh, and they had these interviews and it would be quite intensive because they get up early and they uh, <coughs> meditate maybe from four in the morning to ten in the evening or even more and also spe a speciality there was that the guiding monks would write down the experience of the meditators 
and they was writing down the experience of thousands of meditators. And whenever Vivekananda still is doing that, <laughs> he's still writing down the experience of meditators. And then they would, at that time, they would uh, uh, look at the phenomenological uh, experience of the meditators that they would gather and then uh, look it up against the texts and the intellectual map, even f made from Visuddhimaga or from other texts uh, and even the suttas. So <coughs> uh, this uh, was an enormous work they did there with gathering all this data from yogis and see if uh, it fits also with the text. It is said that, uh, or estimated, that in the Mahasi Center and those centers that were branches of the Mahasi Center, uh, in all these years, uh, about 700,000 yogis were practicing. And uh, And they also were very open towards foreigners. So that <laughs> maybe also an idea would be, w probably was that uh, da Dhamma should also be exported or something. I remember that at the end of uh, my uh, six months wi uh, in uh, Panditarama in Burma, with Saada Upadita meeting him every second day at the end he asked me something of how I like it here or some, something or, and I said well uh, Satipatthana is I said Satipatthana is the best export article of Myanmar and he was so happy to hear that that Vivekananda later told me, at, every, at, at many Dhamma talks later, he would say, ah, that yogi said, <laughs> <laughs> this is best export article from Myanmar. But uh, uh, probably uh, there was also some intention already at that time behind it. But they uh, also had their difficulties with foreigners because they didn't know much about people from the West. And uh, what I hear is that they often they were used that Burmese people, especially the not so educated Burmese people, or they would say um, the, the easiest and fastest practice, uh, uh, simple women from the countryside would have because they would just do what the a monk says, and I wouldn't question it, and uh, <coughs> and they're quite uh, 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 easy in uh, progressing. Uh, but what happened with the foreigners was that they were not so easy in <laughs> progressing, and uh, sometimes they also didn't know what to do with them. Or uh <coughs> when Burmese would uh <coughs> uh, progress. Uh, moderately, but uh, there would be still space to develop, then they would say, okay, then uh, you have been here two or three months, maybe next year you come again for two or three months. But for the foreigners, they would try to let them stay as long as possible. And <coughs> so this happened for quite many, many decades, actually. But was what was also not so long after the uh, founding of the Mahasi Center is that this new independent Burma Buddhist country was uh, trying to get itself together again and also to reconnect with uh, Buddhism. But also they said they thought well, the Buddha lived 2,500 years ago. And there is a belief that the sasana, that is the Buddha's disp dispensation, it will not last forever, but it will last 
for 5,000 years. I don't know if this is in the text, but this is a belief. So, oh, we are halfway. So we should have a, a Buddhist council. And so there have been already five since the Buddha, and they made this sixth Buddhist council, which happened in 1954 until 1956. So over two or even three years this happened, like a rehearsal of the suttas and so on. And Mahasisana, when Mahasisana was invited to also play a crucial role in this um, in this council. And also the Venerable Jnana Ponica, I don't know if he is well known also in Italy, he is a German monk who uh, lived Oh, oh, mm, I think before World War II he became a monk and went to Sri Lanka and he is well known for translating texts into English and into German and uh, being uh, invited to be the director of the Buddhist Publication Society in Sri Lanka which was very active also in translating and his you could say even disciple and uh, who took over from him is Bhikkhu Bodhi. Yeah? So, and then Bhikkhu Bodhi was very active in translating the suttas into modern English and, uh, <coughs> and, and then Bhikkhu Analayo came uh, also and he also uh, became first uh, kind of disciple of a bigger body. Anyway, uh, the Venerable Jnana Ponica was also invited to uh, be a consultant at this international uh, Buddhist council. And so in 1952, he came to Burma with his teacher Jnana Tiloka. And just for some preparation work, and in that time when he was there um, and at that time going even from Sri Lanka to Burma you don't go for a week or so but he would have been there f quite f some time so he used this time that he also practiced at this monastery that I showed you and also at the Mahasi center and he was so inspired by this so-called Mahasi practice or Unarada practice or whatever uh, that he wrote the book The Heart of Buddhist Meditation or in German Geistestraining durch Achtsamkeit and at that time, this was in the 70s and 80s there were few books about Buddhism about, uh, or about mindfulness or whatever uh, but this was one uh, a book that caught quite many of us and <laughs> I here there are several people who started practicing in the 70s or 80s that this book was was it. And for me it was also this book that I said, ah, yeah, that's it. I have to go to Sri Lanka and uh, try to practice that. So, uh, and there he writes also about what he called the new Burmese method. This is not really correct because at that time there have been different new Burmese methods like the Ubakin uh, with uh, sweeping through the body that uh, Goenkaji later uh, 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 also uh, continued or there are others not so well known to us uh, who also would uh, go this direction of having big meditation centers for many lay people, Mogok Sayadaw and Sundlon Sayadaw and so on. They're just not so um, well known in the West. And there haven't been so much foreigners there. So this so-called Mahasi practice how it has been dubbed then uh, uh, also went abroad and they 
started branch centers. For example, one was started in Sri Lanka. Kandaboda was, uh, uh, and Mahasi Sada was teaching there, and later Sada Upandita was teaching there in the 50s or so. And I read that uh, Venerable Premasiri, who is now the abbot of the new Kandaboda, which is just next to it, uh, he had the opportunity to practice even under Mahasi Sada and also Upandita. And then it was also spreading to Thailand and, and there um, there was one Thai monk, what was his name? Uh, no, no, this is the Burmese. Sotok. Chodok. Venerable Maha Chodok, who went to the Mahasi Center and then wanted to is that uh, Mahasi Center is established in Thailand. And so Venerable Mahasi Sada sent a Burmese monk with the name uh, Badan Venerable Ubadanta together with the, Chod with the Thai monk Chodok to Thailand and they established a Mahasi Center in Thailand in, I don't remember the town. Yeah? Uh, and they still uh, quite uh, practice in accordance with this uh, style of Mahasi. There have been also Thai monks coming to the Mahasi Center, going back to Thailand, establishing something they call Mahasi practice, which is not really, it's their own thing. So sometimes, I cannot say this, yeah, but sometimes we are, we are confronted with people who say, I have been practicing Mahasi, and then you hear they have been in this certain Thai tradition uh, where they have completely different or very much different approach, and uh, it doesn't have so much to do anymore with uh, uh, Mahasi. So, uh, yeah. There have been also two interesting persons, un interesting lay people, who practiced in the Mahasi Center, and that was uh, two Indians by uh, mm, Root, but living in Burma. One was Munindraji, a man from Bengal, who uh, was not a monk, but an Anagarika, so in white, and he was practicing in the Mahasi Center. And then Dipama, uh, uh, also by Indian origin, but a woman, but living in Burma. And they say that Deepama was uh, realizing a lot and was very advanced practitioner. And uh, that I think Monindraji even would teach her, I don't know what, <laughs> some mm, super normal <laughs> whatever. No? And <coughs> then something interesting happened, or to me it is interesting. They were very accomplished lay people learning, practicing uh, at the uh, Mahasi Center. And there was a time where there are frequent times in Burma where there is a political unrest. And there was a time where the people from Indian origin had to leave the country or they were, the most were pushed out. And so it seemed that Deepama and Munindraji had to leave Burma and go back to India. And so Deepama went to Calcutta and Munindraji went to Bodh Gaya, to the Burmese temple in Bodh Gaya, which was quite deserted because the Burmese people could at that time not afford to go to India to, uh, to the sacred places. But there was already built also in the beginning of the last century, this Burmese temple, which was meant for pilgrims from Burma, but there were no pilgrims. So Munindraji was taking, uh, uh, oh, uh, was simply staying there, and there were few foreigners tricking in wanting to learn meditation. So Munindraji would teach meditation there. 
And one of the first foreigners to learn meditation from Manindraji was Joseph Goldstein. He was, I think, 20 or very young when he was there. And uh, it seemed that it was not such a formal retreat. They were allowed to go out to the tea store and whatever, but it's still they were practicing there. And um, Manindraji would guide that. And then he got more well-known and more and more people came and four years later there was also a person called Sharon Salzberg coming, she was just 18, and Carol Wilson, she was just 17 or something. So these young people just often went overland to India and then searching and then at that time in the 70s finding, or 60s, 70s, finding some teachings in Bodh Gaya. And at that time Goenka Chi was which is not a uh, Mahasi tradition, but but he not yet has it had established his center, and he was also sometimes teaching in Bodh Gaya. So it, it seems in the 70s or end of 60s for Westerners this was the place <laughs> to be. Anyway, but informed from the Mahasi uh, uh, center through Monindraji and also Deepama sometimes uh, teaching there. And a good friend of mine, who was uh, uh, from Vienna, who was a mm, monk in the forest tradition for 17 years, said his first retreat was in Bodh Gaya in the early 80s or late 70s. And he said he was lucky to have deeper mind for interview, but he didn't know who she was. But anyway, she just said, Please continue. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> I was expecting that she would say the 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 word which would <laughs> make it for you or something. No. And <coughs> and it just came to me because in uh, Burma it was still the the monks, the bhikkhus teaching, not lay people, not the women, but the bhikkhus. Only exception was Ubakin and this lineage. Yeah? But Mahasi not. But then when Munindraji, who was an Anagarika, and Dipama, who was a lay woman, went to India, and they started teaching there. And then these people from America come there and they see the lay people teaching. Then they don't think well, one should be a monk or nun. It was just normal. Because often I thought, how did this shift in the West also happen that there is monks and nuns teaching, but there is also uh, lay people. It's both. And it's important that uh, it, it's both. And uh, so, uh, uh, so for them, it was probably just normal. So when, uh, after several years at the Burmese Vihara, for example, Joseph Goldstein would come back to the United States. Uh, and he had already quite some, lots of experience. Uh, he would just wonder, what to do with that. Yeah. So now this goes a little bit too far, I think, but still I would like to relate it because I just heard a Dharma talk uh, where he uh, would relate that uh, he was a bit lost and he would give a Dharma talk to his aunts, the old Jewish aunts who were very polite but not really interested. And then uh, um, went to Cali he went then to California and he had to uh, look for a restroom but at every restaurant he said it's just for customers and then at the third restaurant he entered the restaurant and he found a friend of his just by uh, chance and this friend said well there is a big Buddhist gathering at Naropa that uh, was founded by Trungpa, and uh, he, he would be teaching there, but he could teach meditation there. So then uh, Goldstein went there, and he was teaching meditation there. 
And this is, and then he had an audience that was interested. And I just by chance heard one of the first talks that he gave at that time. And that was very interesting because it is so different of what is taught now. And it clearly highlights for me that there is someone who learned it, not in Burma, but very close to Burma, uh, very Mahasi-like, very goal-orientated, and he teaches this exactly like this there, even being very enthusiastic, maybe too enthusiastic. And uh, <coughs> it seemed that it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, uh, with the uh, Western uh, practitioners in that way it didn't work out so well. So that he had also to adapt in the way of teaching. And also we had this question about what would medit he would in this talk he would tell those people who had never practiced already what to expect. <laughs> okay. Before IMS, this was 74, 1974. Yeah. And this doesn't happen now anymore like this. Uh, and then, uh, because there was an audience that was interested, they started to organize a retreat. And they organized, what, a three-month retreat. It was the most normal that it must be a long retreat so that people can really dive deep into Dharma and have uh, 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 deep experiences, or whatever is possible in three months, but quite uh, something. And it seemed that they got together three months and uh, <coughs> in a rented place of a monastery. And uh, at that rented place of the monastery, the Christian nun said, well, there is another Christian monastery that is for sale for not so expensive, still too expensive for them. Uh, but they went for it and uh, they even managed to get enough money to uh, uh, buy it. And that's the Inside Meditation Society in Massachusetts today, IMS. And so this is that uh, kind of uh, strength the branch that uh, started here in uh, with Monindraji in uh, in Bodhgaya, and it was just then that they would, when they had the center, that they would invite Mahasi Sayadaw, who obviously also has been teaching there once, and then later Sada Upantita, who several times several times uh, was teaching there uh, to teach at IMS or also at the Forest Center, which was later established for long-term practice. Uh, the last time that Sada Upandita was teaching there is was in, I think, 2007. I had the opportunity to uh, also be there. It was a two-month retreat. However, these places like IMS have had their own development over the years. Uh, uh, so we would not uh, call it a Mahasi center in the, uh, but informed by Mahasi, we could call it. And <coughs> so that was uh, this branch. But there have, has been in the Mahasi Center itself, Ma, the Maha, Venerable Mahasi Sada had a lot of direct uh, disciples that he asked to have interviews and to, to teach there. And I don't know all the names, there must have been many. And there are just some that are, became well known. Yeah? And when they became well known, it also happened that after a while, they got invited to have their own center. So there was, for, uh, there are names like Sada Upandita, Sada Ujjanaka, Sada Ukundala, then Shwe Omin is quite well known, and or Usilananda and others, or this uh, this Achan Badanta who established the center in Thailand, and 
uh, so that could be called the first generation after Venerable Mahasi Sayada. And uh, what I heard from Venerable Vivekananda uh, when he was practicing there, and I don't know, this must have been beginning of the 90s or something, he was a layman. And when he was practicing there as a layperson, there was another crisis in Burma, and the, the government said all foreigners have to immediately leave the country unless uh, the only exception is monks and nuns. So then when Vivekananda thought, well, I want to continue my retreat, I will ordain. <laughs> and then he ordained and he could stay. And he stayed ordained until now. And at the same time, there was another Western monk there. His name is uh, Otama, Ashwin Otama. And he had been teaching here because he was uh, at that time staying in um, Santa Chitarama. So he is a Burmese ordained monk, but he was later staying with the forest monks. And one uh, <coughs> September he was teaching there. So Ashwin Otama and Venerable Vivekananda were colleagues, but they had different teachers uh, for the interview. So Venerable Vivekananda was with Sada Upandita and Ashwin Otama was with someone else. And at that time Sada Upandita wa uh, was invited to have his own monastery, so he left and he took his disciples or some went with him, Vivekananda went with him, and uh, Ashin Otama was staying at the Mahasi Center, so his career went a little bit different. Uh, uh, he was sent to the missionary uh, uh, university uh, to lear learn the theory and so on, and then later uh, went back to the Czech Republic. And in the 90s, and the Czech Republic uh, got rid of communism and the opportunities were arising to teach Dhamma and there was a lot of interest in Dhamma. So uh, Ashin Otama started this uh, summer retreats where I hear that it, there were 80 people or so, so then he also invited Venerable Suchiva to help him and this is how Suchiva came into uh, and came to uh, the Czech Republic and got very uh, uh, famous in the Czech Republic. Anyway, and <coughs> so export article <laughs> in a way by <coughs> uh, people who practiced in the Mahasi Center. Hmm. So I think the main thing I would like to convey is Mahasi practice is actually going back to Unarada <laughs> who is not really uh, 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 m not many people are knowing that but this is going back to the suttas and to the Buddha uh, <coughs> but one somehow can also see it like uh, tree with different branches and as there was a first generation of monks uh, teaching, ma practicing and teaching the Mahasi practice, they had different, star started having different approaches. And this is why sometimes it arises the question, hey, why uh, are you, why is this teacher teaching metta? Sada Upandita would say, you cannot practice metta before you haven't got very deep experience and insight in vipassana. Because he would say then people only want to practice metta and they don't want to they try vipassana. So that is his approach. So he would not teach metta in the beginning. You have to practice quite some time and then he, he would teach metta. But he would teach metta with the aim of also developing the absorptions a along with metta. And then Venerable Ujjanaka would 
asked uh, people to start with a few minutes of metta before doing vipassana or even several days of pure metta practice and then also do vipassana he wouldn't have uh, this it, it seems that he doesn't have this uh, same approach however uh, it would there be called metta for wholesomeness metta for preparation for vipassana not for jhana so and it is through this influence of uh, sadhu janaka that his disciple sadhu indaka would st has started with the metta retreats which would not be an option in panditarama uh, uh, of sadhu upandita uh, so, but uh, he would see that metta is very uh, uh, helpful for uh, and, and, and needed, and especially also for uh, Westerners. And this is also why we have uh, Venerable Vivarnani and Aryanani, who are very close to Sada Uindaka, uh, uh, introducing more and more the metta practice. So one can see that there is not. Every th not everyone has exactly the same approach and there might be even discussions uh, about uh, could one do this or could one not do this and so on. Or Shveo Min a direct disciple of Venerable uh, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw, he would in his later time of practice uh, develop more emphasis on Chitta Nupasana, and the the teacher in Shweomin Monastery nowadays is Utejaniya, who is uh, 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 emphasizing even more on uh, Chitta Nupasana. So I find it quite interesting that Patrick Kearney, I was uh, have a book here of, but I will still quote him. Uh, he would even he he has been the he has been practicing Mahasi Center and Visada Vivekananda as well and Visada Upandita and he was the uh, resident teacher of Blue Mountain Meditation Center. This is a Mahasi Center in Australia, older than quite still some time. He would say, in some way, even Shweomin. Uh, and Dejanir is part of the Mahasi family there, just uh, complementing it or something. But they are arguing about the same things. Yeah. So you c one can have uh, <coughs> any idea about this. But uh, it goes back to Shwe um, uh, was a was disciple of Sado, um, of Mahasi Sado, and. <coughs> Uh, so, uh, the question that for me arises is, okay, what is Mahasi practice? What is, what is really uh, <coughs> core to it or what made it so distinct? And so, I just wrote a few points, but that's just what uh <coughs> comes to my mind. One could be that it's this more pure vipassana approach without having to develop jhanas in the beginning uh, or also that it facilitates the opportunity also for lay people to have long retreats and for me this is uh, maybe the um, has been the most important because so often it happened that they said so now you have to leave you can't just stay for so and so long. And uh, in uh, uh, um, Pantadarama in, uh, in Burma, I come and say, I would like to stay six months. Yes, okay, stay six months. Uh, <coughs> and uh, one is supported by that, that it's open to lay people, that there is a guidance on a regular basis, like uh, there at the time there was something like every second day one would meet a teacher and uh, I think also that the teachers have at least the, they have this background knowledge of 
how practice usually develops. Uh, but when it comes to rising and falling as the primary object, that's not 100% sure. It even happened to me that Sado Pandita, after some time, would give me five points as an object. And when I started in Kandoboda in the 80s, Venerable Prema Siri would give me five points and not rising and falling. But then I heard that within the Mahasi tradition there is a discussion what is better, the rising and falling or five points. And those who are in favor of the rising and falling says five points is not so good because you have to move too much. Yeah? But it could be also that Sometimes this is better, sometimes that is better. For some people this is better, for some time other people that might be better. So anyway, but uh, there are these discussions within the Mahasi tradition. Noting and naming objects, that means labeling, but not necessarily labeling, but taking note, this is emphasized. And uh, <coughs> there might be uh, many other uh, features, but I don't, uh, that might come to your mind. Anyway, so when we speak about Mahasi lineage, then one could uh, see it as a kind of tradition. And I'd just like to end this talk by quoting. Uh, Patrick Kearney in this book Mindfulness about the role of a tradition or a lineage and he says and I'll just uh, sum this up first that there are some people who are very uh, uh, refusing traditions because they see it as a straight jacket. Yeah. But he says it misunderstands the nature and the role of tradition. He says that tradition is not a straight jacket. It is more like a family. It is a community where we feel at home. As such, our relationship to our tradition is not entirely rational. It is a matter of the heart. It is where we feel deeply we belong. And as we all know, families are not necessarily comfortable places to be. Many of us have experienced some form of conflict when we meet up with family members after long absence and find ourselves taking up arguments that began decades ago or never have been resolved. If you find yourself as an outsider witnessing such a dispute, you may wonder what all this is about and why they don't just get over it. But these reflections simply show that you are not a member of this particular family. What, for what do we argue about? What we take to be important? Different communities take different issues to be important and so have arguments about these issues and not others. And then he goes on saying, for example, in Theravada, an even bigger family, they argue about how much Samatha, Vipassana and this topic. And if you ask someone from the Zen tradition, well, they don't see that there's any importance to that. But they argue about should you use koan or should you not co use koan to get uh, 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 developed. But the Theravada person wouldn't see that f as important. So that shows which family you are part of. And in the same way, there are, uh, of course, also probably certain uh, disagreements within the Mahasi family, but there might also be some common ground where there is no disagreement, but uh, uh, that is uh <coughs> uh, a kind of undisputable common ground that makes the family. So that's just some thoughts and uh, also some mm, 
uh, how should I say, uh, I was a little bit searching in books about the Mahasi lineage, uh, just to sum it up. Uh, and let's say it's enough.